Here's the console, nothing extraordinary about it. All right, let's move on. Now, some organs in Leicester City. I, I seem to have missed Leicester out, but I want to mention some of them. St. Peter's Highfield, I've already mentioned in connection with the tab stops. St. James the Greater is a very fashionable church on London Road in, in Leicester. It has a, a, a tailor organ that's been restored by uh, Walker and a member of the Nottingham Society. In fact, uh, John Bellamy was organist here for, for many years. And it has a, a very, very handsome um, congregation and uh, attention to uh, music and, uh, and service format there. Bishop Street Methodist is the main Methodist church in, uh, in Leicester. And you can see there that they've got a, a, an organ that was a Father Smith going back to 1680, rebuilt by Buckingham. Uh, I mentioned him in connection with uh, uh, London and uh, Pentonville. Groves of, of Nottingham have also done some, some work on it in the old days and recently in Hill, Norman and Beard. Uh, the Victoria Road Church I want to mention in particular because uh, it was formerly a Baptist church. Victoria Road is uh, just off London Road, so it's very central. Uh, and uh, it's now, in fact, a Seventh-day Adventist church. It was a tailor organ originally, but uh, Porritt rebuilt it in about 1910. But they had a quite remarkable organist there for many years. And I want to spend a little bit of time telling you something about him. His name was Ben Burroughs, Dr. Ben Burroughs. And he was well known to uh, organists as being the foremost tutor and correspondence tutor for examinations in the country. He himself had got himself a, a doctorate of music very young, in fact, in fact, in which the examination, it was an Oxford examination, you had to compose something in the exam room uh, and to a particular format, particularly fugue and maybe eight part uh, counterpoint or something like that. And he did this. And in fact, he was so bored in the examination, he, he composed three fugues and the examiners had never come across this before. Uh, and he came back to Leicester. He uh, became a member of the lecturing staff at Leicester University for some years. But then he gave that up and decided to set up a, a private tuition uh, business based on uh, Victoria Road Church, where he, he took studio rooms. And he had an amazing number of successes. Uh, and he used to advertise in some of the music magazines, Musical Times in particular, of his success rate. So it was like a, a scoreboard, like a cricket scoreboard, saying he'd had so many um, B buzzes, so many uh, LRMs, so many ARCOs, so many FFRCOs. And, and I can remember being told uh, at one time that his greatest success was coaching um, the organist of York Minster for an FRCO uh, qualification. And that's the quality of the, of the work. He was a composer as well. And uh, he, he composed a huge number of work, works. And uh, several of his anthems uh, were in our, in our um, repertoire for some time. And uh, particularly, uh, introits, uh, short, uh, effective pieces for the beginning of services. And uh, he eventually gave up and he died in, I'm not sure the exact date, I'll tell you, 1966. He was himself a pupil of, of C.H. Kitson, who was the, uh, the great uh, formalist before his time. And uh, the uh, organist that I became involved with when I came to Loughborough was one of his top pupils, George Towers. And we're going to hear something of George Towers' music in a, in a moment or two. Um, he had a remarkable influence in the whole area around Leicester. And a, a book has been written about him. Unfortunately, it's not in print. You can only find it 
as a thesis at uh, Leicester University. Uh, but uh, if you talk to the right people, you might find a photocopy of this, uh, this thesis, and it's absolutely fascinating. There are other important churches in, uh, in Leicester, of course, and I'm just mentioning one or two that I know about. Uh, St. John the Baptist in uh, Clarendon Park Road, and this is one of the, the, the fashionable areas with restaurants and uh, flats and so on. Clarendon Park Congregational Church, uh, which I uh, organ I have played briefly. And this is uh, interesting because it's a porridge organ which Taylor rebuilt. So they did quite a lot of their business rebuilding each other's organs uh, at, at that particular time. Right, the next, uh, next one, please. Now, what about the future? Well, uh, there are a few large national builders, as I've said and a few smaller subcontractors. Uh, there are recently selected use of foreign builders. And there's a bit of uh, uh, uncertainty about this. Kleiss in Germany have uh, built a very fine organ at Bath Abbey. Uh, Riga of Austria have bought, uh, have built one or two organs. And I think the most impressive that I know of is St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Uh, Markusen from uh, Denmark, they have uh, built uh, organs, including uh, uh, two in, in Nottingham. And there are some U.S. builders from the United States of America coming in now, uh, particularly, it seems to me, at, in college chapels uh, at Oxford and Cambridge universities. And there are, of course, there are local tuners and small repairers. A couple more slides and we'll move on. Well, choosing an organ builder, an advisor, is a bit of a problem. Uh, is it going to be a new builder, rebuild, or maintenance and tuning? And there are advisors, and at the next meeting, uh, Zoom meeting of the society, we're going to have a, a talk by a music and an organ consultant and advisor. And it'll be interesting to hear what um, Mr. Hale has to say about uh, this. And he certainly is one of the best known and effective organ advisors in the country. Placing the organ and console is another controversial uh, matter and this is receiving more and more attention as uh, acoustic uh, science becomes a science adopted by organ builders. So they don't put them where it's uh, convenient for other building reasons but they're interested in the sound the organ produces. Next one please. Organ advisors, I've just said something about organ advisors and every diocese had, has an organ advisor. My one encounter with an organ advisor, apart from the one who's our member, whom I know really quite well, and he's a, a real gent. The organ uh, advisor that was at Hereford Cathedral was a pain in the neck because he wouldn't give advice. Um, and so it's, it's a delicate... Um, uh, Tight, walk, tight, tight rope to walk if you're an advisor because one of the controlling influences is often not acoustics, but it's money, the cost of the work that's being done. And that is a delicate problem for most organ advisors. And the next one, placing the organ. I've talked a little bit about place, placing the organ. Uh, Nonconformists tend to have them in the front uh, behind the pulpit sometimes, uh, replacing where there would be an altar if it was a, an Anglican church, or maybe on a gallery. And uh, the whole concept of West End gallery organs uh, is slowly being uh, uh, changed because the choir is inevitably somewhere up there as well, and it's better to have the choir downstairs somewhere towards the front. So there are all sorts of little problems, of course, with placing the organ. And the next one. And an electronic organ. Is it the last resort? Well, it might be. It's certainly in terms of cost it is. And this is a controversial matter. But I have to say, in my opinion, the electronic organs are improving day by day almost, year by year certainly. And there are certainly some absolutely first class builders. And uh, two of the better ones are listed at the bottom there, Rogers who are really an American company, eminent, 
uh, and uh, Makin and Allen electronic organs are ones that I play from time to time. So they're getting better, more comfortable, uh, but it's the acoustics of the building now are becoming a problem because pipe work and loudspeakers don't uh, work in quite the same way at getting uh, sound, sympathetic sound from the building itself. Right, let's stop at that point because I want to say something about George Towers, who was uh, the um, pupil of, of Ben Burroughs. He was the organist in Loughborough that uh, I came to, and I uh, became the accompanist and took over from him in 1982. It's unbelievable, it's so far back. Um, and uh, we sing, still sing quite a lot of his music, uh, anthems in particular. And when he died, um, I tried to get a lot of his uh, compositions published. He was a very modest man. Professionally, he was a director of Lady Bird Books. And you, many of you will know that Lady Bird Books were, were for years printed and published from Loughborough. Uh, but he didn't. And when he, when he retired, in fact, I got a couple of companies to publish his organ works. And now Ian is going to play you one of his uh, organ pieces. And it was specially written for ITV. I think uh, I should explain what happened. Um, we were asked to uh, hold a service, a morning service at 10 o'clock on ITV. And in that time, which is back in the early 80s, ITV used to have services. They don't any longer, of course. Uh, and uh, he was asked to play the end, at the end of the service, play something based on the last hymn. And the last hymn, in fact, was Purcell's tune, Westminster Abbey. And he sketched together, uh, in a matter of a few weeks, uh, a voluntary for the end of the service. And after that, I persuaded him to uh, do the job properly. And he already had that in mind. He did so, and it's published by Kramer. And it's been a very successful composition. Uh, when I last heard, over a thousand copies, individual copies, had been sold. A lot of them in New Zealand and Australia. For some reason, I don't quite know how that came about. Perhaps Kramer have an, a good agent there. So I'm going to ask Ian to play you George Towers' voluntary on Purcell's Westminster Abbey. And here he is playing the organ.
So what I'm going to ask you, uh, David, first is those little um, tab stops that you mentioned. Are they difficult to see? They look ever so tiny. How do, how can you are you having to look for the stop names on them, or are they easy to use? No, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. But yes, once once you get used to them, they're, they're quite easy to see. They, they they come out towards you for about uh, two or three inches, and the width of perhaps one inch. And you and you pl and you and you touch them with a finger. Uh, and Press Quantum. on and press off as well. Uh, up and down, up and down. Up you. and down, I see. Yeah, okay. You, you haven't come across them, have you? Pardon? You haven't come across them, have I've you? I've never, never played an organ with, with those kind of tab stops, no. On electronic organs now. So yeah, I've seen them where you have the... But it tends to be a rocker switch. Yes, well, it's a sort of rocker switch, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Could I come in there? It's Paul Hale here. Of course. Um, they're not actually tabs, David. They're baby stop knobs. Ah. You don't press them up and down. They're just tiny stop knobs. They're engraved in the normal way, but with a very, very contracted stop name on them, just three letters and a pitch. But you just treat them like baby stop knobs. Uh, so they, they go into the organ and they're connected to a composition, a combination piston mechanism, a sort of mechanical one just behind. They're very clever. But I wouldn't want people to think they were like the tabs on electronic organs. They're just baby stop knobs, really. You've just spotted that I'm playing electronic organs more than Taylor organs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll forgive you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else like to ask a question of David? I think Philip's got his hand up. Uh, Hello. Is Philip here? I can't, oh, yes. Um, I think there was one particular question and a few odds and ends, really. Um, feel free to curtail me if, uh, if there's a, other people wanted to come in. Um, but you were talking about materials, excuse me, it's... <coughs> yes, about materials of organ pipes. Um, it might have been in that book by David Michael Baker that, well, well I don't know, that, that mentioned that sometimes... It, oh, oh, I'm boring Paul, obviously. But um, mentioned that sometimes organ pipes can, can be made of glass as well. Uh, do you know anything about that? Uh, what's the speaker? Is it David again? I've no experience. I've no experience of them. Mm. I can't. So you frozen? Hello, hello. Yeah, we're still here. So we, we, we lost you then, David. Or well, I did anyway. Right. No, I've no experience at all. Uh, and uh, you might ask Paul. Paul, he's come across them as he probably he's has. Well, he's just left, so I can't. Um, but if, I, if I might move on to other matters, if there's a moment. Um, uh, oh dear, yes. Um, you, you mentioned that Kleist. It's interesting you singled out Bath Arby, but, uh, but of course, to my knowledge, there's also, there's also Birmingham Symphony Hall, Leeds Cathedral, and two in London that I'm aware of by him. Oh, yes. There are quite a, quite a few. I mean, uh, it wasn't an exhaustive list. Right. <clears throat> and also, uh, when you gave a list of towns in, in uh, Leicestershire, you, know, you named uh, 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 particularly the la a largest town you didn't name, seemed to be Colville, interestingly. No, no. Uh, I ran out of time. I was going to talk about Hinkley uh, because there's a very interesting organ in here. And I. So you're breaking, hello? Oh. On a bit much. So, can you rewind? You, you're breaking up again. Oh, I was going to talk about Hinckley because at uh, the URC church in Hin Hinckley, most interesting, it was transferred from Islington, the Union Church in in uh, Islington, in about the eight. So, so do, you, do you mean is that is that the Union Chapel by any chance near um, the Highbury and Islington tube station? At Union Chapel, it is because I, because I, it's currently got a Willis organ where I've, I've done a couple of recitals there as it happens. But, uh, but so, but obviously with, with connections both both ends, I'm quite interested to know about the organ movement there. It, the original organ was a Holditch organ. Well, they're, they're a Northamptonshire firm, aren't they, Holditch? Yeah, and and uh, what what happened was they felt it wasn't a big enough sound for the congregation. Well, they had a. Right gallery all the way around to Dislington and they, they still do organ right and it was moved about 1900 and Walker's rebuilt it and it has been rebuilt recently we've got a question from Richard Eaton 
Um, let's move on to Richard. Thank you. Well, it's, it's not a question, actually. Just just two points. Um, I was interested in the, the glass pipes. And Mozart, of course, wrote a piece for glass harmonica, didn't he? Yeah, um, he did. But but also um, at Meissen, at the Meissen um, porcelain factory um, in Germany, to celebrate the millennium, I, I think to celebrate the millennium, they built an organ with porcelain pipes. And I've played it, and a very charming sound it makes. They're not, it's only one rank of porcelain, the, the, the front, the front pipes. Uh, it's very small, little, little, little chamber organ, and with a limited compass. But um, we know that, that porcelain, will uh, you can make pipes out of porcelain that, that make quite a good noise. And the second point um, is that when the organ was put into Birmingham Symphony Hall, um, they floated quite a lot of it um, on a barge, uh, including the really big pedal pipes um, of the canal. And they were, and they, if you know the the symphony hall, it backs onto the canal, and they they brought them up the canal. And where did the canal meet the sea? And I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I just know that they brought the pipes up the canal. Um, yep. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. Um, I wondered on the Taylor and Porritt organs uh, that, that you mentioned, uh, were they predominantly pneumatic action or, or did it depend on the size of the installation? Uh, well, as, as, far, as far as I'm aware, almost all of them are tracker. But I stand correction on, on, on that. Right. I mean, between them, they, they produce a lot of organs, particularly for village churches. And... Uh, you know that they've lasted incredibly well, uh, but but they were they were fairly standard instruments, two, two manuals, uh, may, maybe fifteen stops, something like that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering with the um, with with the tab stop system whether whether that was um, uh, uh, electric or, or or pneumatic, and therefore whether that that. Um, uh, was also um, used in the action, the, the keyboard action as well. But by the sound of it, they stuck to tracker for for keyboard. I, well, I think so. I, I mean, it's a pity that Paul uh, has gone because he, he, he might well know the answer to that question. Right, thanks. Despite being an engineer, I'm not terri terribly versed in, uh, in the mechanics of the of, uh, tracker organs. That's it. That's an admission. Thank you, both Davies. Any further questions from anybody? Uh, Derek? Uh, I played a trailer organ in Hucknall. Uh, I belong to a small church called the Church of Christ, a bit similar to the Baptists, and uh, one of our members forked out enough to buy one. Now, this was in 1959, and uh, we eventually, of course, price was crucial, so we only had a small one. It was a two-manual proper uh, console, uh, but uh, Taylor put it in a corner and in fact the whole of one side was the shutters because everything was enclosed. And it's interesting, it was about that time when there was a lot of discussion about extension organs and whether yeah. you should have them or not. And this was just a three rank extension with uh, diapason, solutional and uh, flute. And it, it made about uh, what, four, five, ten, twelve stops altogether with Two on the pedal, uh, but uh, that was electric, electric action right through for that one. Where did it come from? Do you know, or was it no, really totally new? Totally new. It must have been one of the last ones that Taylor. Yeah. Well, I'm, I remember going down to Leicester. We went into the works, and it was most of it was built in the tower of the uh, woodwork, and got yes. some pipes in. So that was about 1958. Good. Thank Is you. It, is it still in action, the organ? No, it was moved when the church closed to another church in Bullwell, and then they built it over a uh, heating system. So it just warped everything and destroyed <laughs> it. So it's just been, I don't know who's got it, but it's just been, well, I think it's just been used for bits and pieces. Yes. But if, if I can produce a little anecdote, my uh, organ that I play, the Porritt organ, doesn't blow hot air at the organist, it blows cold air at the organist because the dr air is drawn directly from outside into the blowers and then straight into the organ. 
So it's unaffected by central heating in the church. <laughs> the, the, the congregation don't know this, of course. It's the poor old organist who knows it. <laughs> Any thanks. Mr Butterworth? Um, yes, uh, we, we saw a picture of a rather nice case for the organ in um, Markfield Parish Church, which I think was Taylor, was it? Taylor? No, it's, it's, uh, it's a sister organ of, of Loughborough Baptist Church. And they were no, built... Markfield in, Parish Church. Pardon? Markfield Parish Church. Yes. You showed us a picture of that. I did indeed. Yes. There was a, a small one manual, well, in a sense, small one manual Taylor organ in Markfield Methodist Church. Ah, I don't and know. That ended up being the organ that I installed at Neaton um, back in the 1970s. And... Uh -huh. We visited it uh, on one of John Moorhen's, um, it was one of the Ho days, I'm not quite sure which direction the Ho was, uh, but, but some members will have no doubt been there. Um, and I must say, I, I recall uh, one part of the organ, the sort of girdle bit at head height, that I needed to get four farmers, farm workers, from the local farm to lift it into place. It was so solid and so heavy, solid oak, it's massive. And the pipes for the front case, although it was only a one manual, the pipes were so heavy that, well, they're the heaviest, I did actually just manage them. I couldn't possibly now. They were incredible and they weren't zinc. They were solid tin and lead. And apparently Taylor's pipework was generally made in Germany to a very high standard. It, the, 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 quite an early date for, for organ pipes to come from Germany, wasn't it? Yes, the, it was. Transportation problems. Well, that, that, I've heard that many, many times, but I don't know whether you can confirm it or not, but they were superb, well, they are superb pipes. Yes. They're, they're beautiful, but they're blooming heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Phillips mentioned in the chat is drawing air from the outside in cold spells an issue. <laughs> no, well, for the poor old organist it is. And in fact, uh, George Towers installed an electric fire to blow uh, warm air at the legs of the organist at the console. And it's still there working and I use it in the winter. <laughs> <clears throat> if, if I might comment on my question a bit, I was, I was referring more to the uh, like where, where the dampness from uh, well, because it's obviously they say it's, if I got it right, it's high humidity when it's uh, like cold, almost yeah. Arctic weather. Um, where it's all just where the, where the damp of it sort of uh, uh, trying to use a vulgar term, whether that mucks up the uh, organ mechanics and things. Uh, bye, Richard. Well, well it, it, it certainly does. And uh, in, in the last uh, year and a half, I've been very concerned about the weather affecting the organ that I play because I haven't played, I played for I think, two services in 18 months. Uh, and uh, the organ has remained in remarkably good tune despite the uh, fluctuations in humidity and uh, heating. And of course, the central heating has not been on in the church in that time. And it might be that that was the controlling influence, not the outside weather. I wonder if anybody else has got any experience of uh, how organs have survived the last 18 months. David Butterworth. Um, I think in theory, uh, the best plan for drawing air for an organ is to uh, ensure that it comes from the same building in which the organ is situated. So you're simply recycling an, uh, a given status quo uh, and certainly tuning wise you would imagine that that would be the best thing because the outside temperature can be di very different to the inside temperature and that would have potentially disastrous consequences for the tuning. Um, I recall doing some work in my early days in Nottingham on the organ at Christchurch Cinderhill. Uh, one of the problems with that organ uh, which doesn't exist now by the way is that you had to vault over the organ blower box to get to the organ um, which could be very uncomfortable for some people so with the help of a friend of mine who was an electrical engineer uh, we moved the blower to the 
outside of the church. We had a little chamber built, quite inconspicuously built in a corner of the churchyard. And from then on, the air was taken from outside. Didn't seem to affect the tuning, but what we hadn't reckoned on was that there was a pig farm very nearby. <laughs> and uh, 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 so, uh, so depending on the wind, the direction of the wind, uh, we could end up with this awful smell in the church, uh, thanks to the organ and unfortunately thanks to my efforts to improve the situation. Uh, regarding other installations, changing the subject somewhat, um, notwithstanding what I said about equality or evenness of temperature, uh, the organ in the Albert Hall does draw its wind directly from outside. And there always used to be a big tuning problem there, but it seems to have stabilized somewhat now. And in the Masonic Hall, again, uh, the organ there I know draws its, or both organs draw their wind from outside, but tuning wise, they're very stable. Uh, the advantage is that of course, in dry circumstances, such as the Albert Hall as it now is, and the Masonic Hall, very low relative humidity. It's very nice to get some damp air into the church, even if it's by that means. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any further questions? What about from our uh, colleagues in Northampton area? Anything from you guys and girls? You've already heard from me on that. Sure. Anybody else for any questions? Ah, Sean. Do you want to meet yourself, please? Yeah, just going back to this humidity problem, okay? Uh, where, where, where I'm at Carrington, okay, I have a situation where there's no eating on at all when I'm trying to practice, uh, perhaps an art or two. And, and, what, and what is happening is, because, because the air, it's so cold and there's, and there's quite, quite a bit of moisture in the air, you can actually see the bellows dithering and move, yeah, up, moving up, up and down trying to keep up, keep up with the demand for air. Uh, sometimes you can even hear it on the speed of the pipe. This is a bit, uh, you know, uh, infuriating a little, a little bit for me. That, that, that's the major problem. And then, of course, when we come to Sunday, when we have a drumming heating on full and your air pockets circulating, yeah, it sounds as if the tuning is, is really flat, but in most cases, that ain't the case. It's physically impossible. So that's another slant on that. Thank you, Sean. Any comments on that, Mr. Gabe? No, I don't think so. Good. Okay, any further questions from anybody before we move on? Okay, I'd like to ask one final question. And, and, and for having the beauty of running the slides from this side, I saw a slide that you wouldn't have seen. And it was titled, But the Big Question. And the first line on that slide, which I'm going to ask David, because I think it's an interesting one. Where are the organists for the 21st century, David? Yes, that was to be a stimulating question in case nobody asked any questions. But it's a, it's a serious problem, as all the organists know, that there are very few young people coming in to, uh, to learn to play the organ and willingly to become organists. And if it wasn't for the Oxbridge um, system of having college uh, organ scholars, I think we'd be in Queer Street in the country. It's a, a pity, but uh, uh, the Nottingham Society were left some money and were interested in trying to provide local scholarships for organ, and organ pupils, not very successfully. And there's another organ society trying to do the same. It's a, a real struggle. Indeed it is. May, may I comment on that, please? Of course. Um, well, two things to say, actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to say this uh, as, as if trying to fly flanks with people, but um, I think that the main comment is um, uh, the, the past president of uh, the Organ Club, not to confuse with the Organ Associations, this is the Organ Club as founded by Henry Willis III in the 1920s. Um, he, uh, a past person called John Miley, who lives uh, near Peter, as it happens. Does anyone know the name, incidentally, before I continue? Um, okay. Yes. <coughs> yes sir. Is, that Pen is that Helen speaking? Yes. Yeah, we went, well, uh, with our association, we went, we went to his, his local church, and, oh, and his house, so, yes. But um, he, 
he runs something called OXO, OCS, Organ Club Student Organization, I think. So, uh, and we had our like AGM about a month ago, and it was mentioned. Oh, Paul Hale was present for that as well, as it happens, because he's he's now our pre- now our president, if I've got that correct. Um, but they're kind of applauding the the, the the members he's drawing in, and they have an annual uh, what do you call it annual competition. So uh, maybe it's worth knowing that that's um, that could be a ray of hope as such, although they they're probably disproportionately distributed. And additionally, our own association has a David Morgan fund. Is there anything do you want to comment on that, Helen, or anyone? Um, uh, yes, Philip. Thank you. I was I was going to come in on that. Yes, we we had. Um, 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 a fund left to us by the late um, David Morgan, and we've kept that fund going. I'm not, I didn't know him personally, he died some years ago, but the fund is available for supporting students, and we have supported a number of students um, uh, over the years. I mean, one at the moment is, is due to go to Birmingham Conservatoire in September, um, but we've always had two or three students. but. Uh, the question is, as you say, where do the next ones come from? Indeed. I, I'm aware that um, recently from a, a phone call with Ian Wilcock at Rotherham Minster, they're, they're about to start a, uh, a, a young chorister's choir and he's <coughs> hoping to uh, encourage uh, some of the choristers to get into the organ uh, through that route. So it's nice to hear that Rotherham Minster are... Uh, trying to get a, a boys choir together at least that's 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 good news and I, I, indeed a girls choir as well i think so good luck to them we'll move on to uh mr david hanford to uh say thanks and to um put his take on things please david well thanks very much ian um thank you very very much indeed david for what has really been a fantastic um presentation um I think your effortless grasp of the subject and enthusiasm for it uh, certainly certainly shone through uh, for me. Um, in many ways, uh, although you were talking about uh, Leicestershire, it, it could actually have been in, 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 in a, a lot of instances a potted history of the development of uh, organs in, in England uh, generally. Um, another thing that uh, struck me was the number of churches that I've, I've actually passed uh, on my travels and not realise there was a, a, an interesting organ um, lurking be, behind the doors. Uh, one particular church I shall now look out is, is Swithland Church. Um, we, we often uh, go for country walks in Swithland Woods, which is uh, near Bradgate Park, for those who don't know it. I'd absolutely no idea that uh, there was um, uh, the, the oldest organ in Leicestershire uh, in that church. So thank you for uh, pointing out a number of these uh, the, these interesting uh, instruments that uh, I'm sure many of us will, will look out on our, on our travels. Um, thanks to everyone also for participating in the, in the Q&A, um, a number of interesting points coming out there, and also to uh, Ian uh, for his, his technical input uh, to the session. Um, and I think really all, all um, it, it's, it's beholden to me to do is to ask you to um, join me in a virtual round of applause for, for David for a, a really fascinating evening. Thank, thank you, David. W my wife and I were in Switzerland Woods at the weekend. Ah. And have an idea we passed you and I was uh, confident enough it was you to open conversation and we were walking back to the car or something. Well, it's probably just as well because it wasn't <laughs> on that occasion. <laughs> David Hanford, do you happen to know the date of the next meeting? I do indeed. I was just coming on to that, Ian. Uh, yes, it's Monday the 17th of May um, at 7.30. Uh, which is the uh, the illustrated presentation by Paul on uh, some of his recent uh, org organ projects uh, as consultant, which has been been previously mentioned. Uh, those of you with a keen eye on these things will also note that it's uh, allegedly the day for the next um, 
uh, stage on the government's roadmap. Uh, and so um, I hardly dare mention that, um, that there may be um, opening of indoor hospitality venues also on that, that night, but I, I hope that that won't put you off uh, joining us um, on Zoom. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we can certainly do better with social distancing than, uh, than, than any local hostelry. So do please, uh, do please join us. Uh, Monday the 17th of May 7, 7.30 for, for, Paul's, uh, for Paul's talk uh, and obviously a warm invitation to our friends from Northamptonshire as, as well should they be able to join us. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give the publicity out. Thank you very much Helen. So I think that's uh, all really from me. Thank you all very very much for coming. Thank you David once again and, uh, and uh, hope to see you on the 17th of May.